Hello! Today we'll be looking at a neurologic clinical case from neuroanatomy through clinical cases, specifically one called intractable hiccups. Intractable hiccups. There we go. We'll be looking at salient features and discussing the key clinical concepts involved. In this case, we have a 50-year-old woman. Uh, let's call her Elise. So let's meet Elise who developed a bilateral retroorbital headache, okay? Now let's make this a bit red behind the eyes. That is associated with nasal discharge. I'll draw in a nose and some drips here. Two weeks prior to presentation. She was presumed to have sinusitis, so she was treated with oral antibiotics, okay? Let's finish this drawing of a bottle up. And there we go. And this resolved her symptoms, so check, she's okay. Her patient history, however, was reviewed and she revealed that 14 years ago, she had an episode of vertigo, nystagmus, there we go, and dysarthria, dysarthria. She had a negative workup done, so she had a negative workup, as MRI was not yet available then. To clarify, vertigo results in the sensation of feeling off balance, which may be perceived as you or the world around you spinning. Nystagmus, I'm going to use a silly little drawing here to help us remember it, is used to describe repetitive involuntary eye movements that can be from side to side, up or down, or let's make this a nose, and a circular pattern all around. Um, so then dysarthria, let's make this a sad face, results in difficult to understand slow or slurred speech, which may be caused by neurological disorders making controlling speech muscles difficult. Because of this, an MRI was then scheduled. However, she suddenly developed intractable hiccups that lasted for five days. So she went back to her position. So she went back. The results, both the general and the neural wait, whoops, um, undo neurologic exam were both entirely normal. So let's first discuss the different features of this case. There you go. One of the key symptoms she recently developed is intractable hiccups. This is when hiccups last longer than a few minutes. Some even last for months to years. This can be caused by lesions in the posterior fossa. Okay, posterior fossa particularly the medulla, medulla, known as the hiccup center. This is supported by the fact that signs of medullary dysfunction do include vertigo, ataxia, nystagmus, nausea, vomiting, respiratory arrest, autonomic instability, and hiccups. The other key feature of this case that she developed is a bilateral retroorbital headache. It's a very common neurologic symptom, and while it's not usually a cause of concern, can be signaled for life-threatening conditions. This is caused by mechanical traction, inflammation, or irritation of innervated structures in the head. There are different types, which we'll go over, so the different headache types. One type is called a tension headache, so let's write in tension, and it is the most common. It is a steady, dull, and squeezing pain on both sides of the head, which we'll represent by this red oblong. This usually lasts for 20 minutes to about 2 hours. Cluster is another type of headache characterized by extremely severe pain and a steady boring sensation at the back of one's eye. Let's draw in the eye and use red for behind the eye, which usually lasts about 30 to 90 minutes. So 30 to 90 minutes. Another type is a migraine, which is often unilateral. It is a throbbing pain, usually preceded by warning symptoms like visual blurring. Okay, let's draw in the pain on one side. Shimmering, scintillating distortions, to name a few. Uh, this, is, this usually lasts for 30 minutes to about 24 hours. So finally, we have sinus headaches. Um, this is a result of pressure buildup in flame and clogged sinuses. Let's draw in and signify that with red around the nose, the sinus. And, oh, whoop, let me make, like, clear that mistake up. Uh, pressure buildup. It, it's caused by pressure buildup. Headaches may have many causes, but it may be associated with intracranial pathology. Whoops, sorry, let me fix that. Okay. 
Given that the occurrence of her symptoms many years prior may be indicative of brainstem dysfunction, so there we go, brainstem dysfunction, yeah, uh, the most likely diagnosis is a chronic or recurrent lesion of the brainstem. So lesion of brainstem, especially the medulla. Some possibilities would include demyelination, a low-grade tumor, so demyelination, a tumor, small recurrent hemorrhage in the arterial venous malformation or cavernous angioma, and finally, a vertebrobasilar migraine. Going through these possibilities one by one, demyelination is a condition where the myelin sheath or protective covering of nerve fibers in the brain are damaged, causing neurological problems. Low-grade tumor is one where cells and tissues appear seemingly normal under a microscope, so appear normal. A small recurrent hemorrhage is um, a bursting of a blood vessel. And a vertebral vascular migraine is a rare type where it originates in the brainstem, which could be caused by blood vessel constriction, limiting blood flow to the brain. Okay, so lowered blood flow because of that. Having narrowed the area of interest to the brainstem, a brain MRI was performed, as seen in the image presented. The MRI revealed a small bright region on the unenhanced T1-weighted images consistent with subacute hemorrhage. There we go, subacute hemorrhage, located in the dorsal portion of the rostral pons in the region of the obex, so obex region. The patient was briefly admitted for observation and then was discharged home with an appointment for an angiogram. So an angiogram is a procedure done using x-ray images, x-ray imaging, and a special dye to view blood flow through the brain. And this was scheduled approximately one month later. So there we go. It was scheduled one month later. Was the blood had resolved to look for an arterial venous malformation. So it was scheduled one month later to wait for the blood resolve to resolve to check for an arterial venous malformation. There we go. Following the procedure, results actually came back negative, and it was felt that the patient most likely had a cavernous angioma. Cavernous angioma. Cavernous angioma, which can occur anywhere in the central nervous system, so anywhere, whoops, in the CNS, it is characterized by an abnormality of blood cells, blood vessels, sorry, um, by large and clustered capillaries resulting in slow blood flow through the vessels. Okay, let's represent this by drawing in some arterioles and capillaries and veins and venules. And let's put in purple to represent the large cluster of capillaries. And there we go. That results in lowered blood flow. So, whoops, um, let me fix that. Gotta, that's not the right picture, sorry. <laughs> um, so three to four months later, a follow-up MRI scan revealed resorption of the hemorrhage, which can be seen in this circled part of the image. So the hemorrhage was actually resorbed. Um, Though the way cavernous angiomas are treated is ca uh, controversial, concern regarding the possible high risk should another bleed occur in this location led to the decision to treat it by surgical resection. So it's controversial because of the high risk, um, but they still decided to proceed with surgical resection, which is removal of tissue, so tissue or organ, uh, at least part of it or all of it. This was particularly done on the posterior fossa. So the cavernous angioma was confirmed through pathologic examination of the tissue, which is checkmarked there. Following the surgery, the patient was able to make a complete recovery without any deficits. Deficits. See, at least as well. And actually, this marks the end of a neurological case adopted from Dr. Hal Blumenfeld's Neuroanatomy Through Clinical Cases.
So Dr. Hal Blumenfeld, got to give proper credit where it's due. Uh, neuroanatomy, neuroanatomy through clinical, okay, wait, whoops, sorry, um, clinical cases. Um, this was done in cooperation with Rose Aspirin, Trisha Kunanan, and Neil Hakob. Thank you for watching. Bye!